Son, and the Holy Spirit. In my second year of university, I took a, uh, a history course. It was one of those 100 level history courses where there were like 250 people in attendance. Um, and around the time of fall break, we had our first test. And the test was actually held um, with one class left to go. And uh, the professor decided, you know, we're going to have this test, but we're still going to have class the day before fall break begins. Um, the day after the test, the class after the test, only about 15 students showed up. It's not surprising, really. Um, but the professor showed up and kind of, you know, looked at the class and was like, yeah, okay, that's fair enough. That's about what I expected. And uh, he then went on to say that he was planning to cancel class that day. But he actually just was curious to see how many folks would show up. And uh, then he said, well, because you all showed up, you get 10 extra points of, of credit on your test. Um, he wrote down our names and, and he told us we get the credit. And so this Sunday is one of these odd Sundays where the fourth Sunday of Advent happens to fall on Christmas Eve. And nine times out of ten, church attendance is a little depressed. It's a little down. Um, and that, you know, we can look around and sort of see that. Um, I'm not taking names this morning. Okay? But if, I, if we were doing extra credit, I think you would all get ten. <laughs> just say that. But uh, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, though, um, I do think that we actually get a little bit of extra credit for being here this morning, um, because for one, we get to hear the final message of the Advent season. Uh, we get the final message that we only need to wait just a little while longer for God's promises to be made good. This morning's gospel reading sets the stage for what we'll be celebrating in just a few short hours. So in some sense, we're getting the first part of the Christmas story. But the extra credit that we're getting here this morning uh, is not just that we're hearing the story of the Annunciation of Mary. The story of the Annunciation itself offers some insight into what our relationship with God should look like, what it involves. In all the readings from Scripture, I think that the Annunciation really captures the imagination and invites us to step a little deeper into the mystery of faith. Because the story of Mary and the angel Gabriel is the story of how faithful attentiveness <clears throat> to God can transform our lives. And I hope you'll indulge me here in a quick rehash of what we've heard from the Gospel readings throughout Advent. On the first Sunday of Advent, we had Jesus talking about the end of time and challenging his hearers to, to remain awake, remain alert. On the second Sunday, the Gospel of Mark introduced us to John the Baptist and told us about what John was doing. And then last Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent, we got the Gospel of John's report about John the Baptist. So for the last three Sundays, what we've had are stories where the setting is public and the characters are concerned with sort of the universal implications of God's coming. But it's not so with the Gospel lesson from this morning. The setting is private. And Mary is not all that concerned with the broad implications of bearing the Son of God. Now to be fair, the angel Gabriel does say that the child that Mary will conceive will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So there are universal implications to, to the angel's message. But if you look closely at Mary's response, you might notice that she doesn't seem all that concerned with the big picture. Instead, she is attentive to one thing. She dwells on the news that she will be pregnant. How can this be, she says, since I am a virgin? It's almost like all of the big promises pale in comparison to the news that she will be pregnant. And I think rightly so. 
I don't doubt that if the angel had told the full story of what would happen because of Jesus' coming into the world, Mary would still have been only concerned with the intimate reality of bearing a child. And here's where I invite you all to do a little bit of uh, imagining with me. For nine months after this episode, Mary became more aware of the impact of the angel's message. She knew and could literally see that what was promised was coming to be. And I wonder if she ever really thought about the big, pic big picture. I wonder if she recalled the angel's visit and began to sort of imagine what her child would be. I wonder if she daydreamed about what she could do to make sure that all the angel's promises would come true. Now, I like to imagine that she never really lost her focus, that she never turned her mind away from the simple fact that she was pregnant, that she had made herself vulnerable, that no matter, no matter what, what else might happen, there was a life growing inside of her. And I like to imagine that she prayed constantly. Not that her child would become king or be called all kinds of wonderful names or go on to change the world. Rather, I imagine that she prayed simply that she might be a good mother, that she might remain open to the working of the Spirit, that she might continue to know the transforming power of God. I like to imagine that Mary kept that focus. Because I think that there's a great lesson for us in what Mary's response to God was. See, I'm convinced that each one of us, in some way, at many different points in our lives, is called by God to be especially open to the working of God's power in our lives. I'm convinced that each one of us is invited to participate in some small task not of our own making, that helps to build God's kingdom. The task may not be all that monumental. It may be really simple. It could be as simple as, you know, driving a friend to, a group, to the grocery store. But no matter what the task might be, I'm convinced that God visits each one of us and asks us to make room for something other than what we want. And if we do our part and remain focused, then over time, we may discover that making room for God's will transforms us. And we may be rewarded with the joy of knowing that we did our part to further God's kingdom. Now, if you're here this morning, my guess is that you're not here just because you were hoping to get some extra credit. <laughs> guessing that you're here because God has begun a work in you. Now, perhaps you don't know exactly what it is yet, but perhaps it makes you feel a little different every once in a while. Perhaps it gives you a little kick every now and then. Perhaps it wakes you up in the middle of the night. It might be the smallest urging of the Spirit for you to make room for God in your life. But whatever it might be, I urge you to be attentive to it. Let it grow. Over time, you will see the difference that it makes. And then, at the end of the season of waiting, you will be able to rejoice in the knowledge that God has been at work in all 